George, uh, it's really lovely of you to come and speak to me after that rather passionate and polarised debate. Uh, but I did want to follow up one or two of the issues which were raised from the floor, uh, which perhaps we could uh, uh, explore a bit further. Um, particularly, I'm interested in what you mentioned in one of your answers, land sharing and land sparing. So if I could give that some context, you just made the point to me that um, all uh, farming is, is a technological intervention, and I would agree to a degree, uh, but I would say that if you go back to the transition from hunter-gathering to agriculture, uh, we took on a role, a much more interventionist role, as ecosystem managers, and, and modern agriculture as we know it today it has extrapolated from that. And during my childhood, I was born in 1950, I witnessed, initially as an urban, urbanite, uh, the transition into chemical agriculture because, of course, the Harbour Bosch process had given rise to the use of nitrogen fertiliser and then later pesticides. And I witnessed the impact of those chemical inputs on the countryside during my adolescence and didn't like it. And I became a sort of environmentalist, maybe not as uh, focused on that as you are, but nevertheless, what drove me into agriculture was an environmental concern for food producing in a more environmentally friendly way. And that was what led me back to the land, to the, my commune, which I started up in 1973. We were trying to farm in harmony na with nature, but at the same time produce realistic quantities of food. And I suppose since then, my passion has been, the epicentre of it has been on food production, not just nature, but I've always been convinced that you can produce food working in harmony with nature. Now, what you just said was you think that land sparing is more efficient than land sharing, which is essentially what I've just described. So I'd love to hear more about what you think about that. So uh, there's a huge amount of science showing that land sparing um, offers much greater ecological restoration, uh, much richer wildlife, richer food chains, more complex ecosystems than land um, sharing does, uh, than, than sort of trying to accommodate wildlife on your farm. Now, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not against doing that as well, you know, and, and it's lovely if it can be done without seriously affecting production and stuff, that's fantastic. Can I just intervene but, and no, say... No, 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 you can't, because you, you okay. asked a massive long question. I've given you a tiny fraction of an answer, so let me finish. So... I uh, shall <laughs> forget my, the point of my intervention. Good, fine, that's great. Um, so, um, the, um, 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 uh, the aim of an environmentalist, which is, I think, what we both are, is to have as much land and sea as possible for wild nature as there can be, uh, because there is nothing to compare to the complexity of a natural wild ecosystem. Uh, all human food producing systems are simplified human food chains. They're, they're, they're extremely simplified by comparison to the complex systems in nature. They are Two managed ecosystems. Systems. Yeah, okay. So, uh, but then, and, and the management is simplification. That's what happened. That's, that, that's why the management is done, in order to turn something which was producing loads of different species in loads of different stages into one kind of food or perhaps a couple of kinds of food from that one piece of land which can be extracted by people. That's simplification in ecological terms. And it's a radical simplification in all viable food producing systems. Yes, we're acting as the top predator and we're suppressing the Much higher, more than that. The yeah, higher yeah. layers. Well, it depends on whether it's permaculture or whether it's chemical monoculture. There's a, there's a gradation. Well, yeah, but you, you're sub even in permaculture, you are substituting all, almost all the wild plants with cultivars of different kinds, aren't you? And you know, you've got fences, you've, you, know, you keep the deer off your, your permacultural courgettes, you, know, you, you want to, of course you want to. Yeah. Um, and, and if it's livestock farming, you, know, you don't want the wolves mixing with your livestock, Correct. do you? Correct, so, so you get rid of the wolves. So, yeah, so, so it's, it, these are radical interventions. Yes, uh, from, there from, are, there from are, the are they're point important point interventions. So, so my interest is in saying let's spare as much land as possible from these simplifying interventions as we can if we're going to stop the sixth great extinction in its tracks, stop the collapse of the abundance and diversity of wildlife, stop the collapse of our life support systems, then we should be sparing that. And the places where I'd start 
are the places which are least productive. So the Welsh Hills, the, for the instance. The Welsh Hills, for instance. You and I both know Wales quite well. Uh, there are very large tracts of Wales where you have one sheep per hectare, one sheep per two hectares in some places, one sheep per five hectares in some places, enough to nibble out all the tree seedlings and prevent any regeneration from happening. Not enough by any stretch of the imagination to make a living for anyone. It's an incredibly profligate use of land. Now, we don't like the profligate use of farm chemicals, do we? We don't like herbicides slashed all over the place, pesticides and the rest of it. Why, why should we like the profligate use of land? That's even more damaging to nature. Well, I would argue, and we both know the Cambrian Mountains quite well, that the kind of farming system which is just wall-to-wall, extensively managed, set-socked sheep is not farming in harmony with nature. So I think there's more... Uh, that we share there than you might think. But what I, the intervention I wanted to make was about land sharing because you, in your film last night, uh, visited Ian Tolhurst, a, a friend of mine, I've known him for 40 years, and you pointed out he was farming with insects and you clearly loved what he was doing. Yeah, yeah. Now he is land sharing. He's producing vegetables, an abundance of vegetables, remarkably high yields, you pointed yeah, that out. Right, yeah. Farming in harmony with nature He's allowing a coexistence of uh, predatory and pest insects and much more, actually. And he would be an exemplar of what I would call land sharing. And you seem to like that. Yeah, but horticulture occupies 0.8% of the land surface of the UK. And, uh, you know, if we can order it like Tolly, that is fantastic. We could. Uh, yeah, no, totally. And I'm completely in favour of that. I'm going to be following Tolly across this year, actually. Good. Until, well, let me tell you yeah, something else about yeah, Tolly. Wait a minute. Let me finish what I'm going to say first. <laughs> Blimey. <laughs> Worse than John I'm Humphrey. a difficult character <laughs> to be uh, in discussion with. I apologise yeah, no, for no, that. No, no, no. You're just a difficult character. Anyway. No, no, no. You, you, you're a gem. You're a total gem. We all love you, but you're wrong. Anyway, um, but it's 0.8%. Is, is what horticulture occupies. Um, and so, you know, if we share a bit of that, um, that's great. If we don't, it doesn't make a huge impact. But if you're talking about livestock, you know, livestock in this country occupy 51% of the whole land well, area. Don't now, that is the area that where we could make a massive difference if we spare most of that well, land. Just you're on territory that is very familiar to me now because I, you may know this, I'm an ex-carrot grower. Did you know that? Yeah, I, so, mean, I know you're an so, ex-carrot uh, So yeah. I, I used to grow yeah. carrots. You have it branded on you, yeah. ex-carrot grower. <laughs> yeah. Recovering, yeah. recovering carrot grower. <laughs> yeah, probably still not completely recovered <laughs> because I used to grow exceedingly nutritious carrots and mm. the main reason they were nutritious is because they were only grown one year in an eight-year rotation mm. or seven years. The rest of it was either one uh, crop of grain, which was fed to our dairy cows, or grass and clover. Mm. And the reason for that long rotation, and Polly would agree with this, got a seven year rotation. Exactly, yeah. is you need to build up fertility and then run it down, and you need a diversity of crops to mimic the natural ecosystem. Now, in the case of Peter Seger, who was just on the platform with you, or Ian Tolhurst, they speed up the system, in Peter's case, by having two thirds of the land in grass and cutting it and composting it, or in Tolly's case, using wood chip and other inputs to make a biologically extremely intensive system, positive intensive. Yeah. Whereas in my case, because I'm farming on poorer land with higher rainfall, thinner soil. It's on 3B. What, what, what's your grade? Four, probably. It's quite tough. We're pretty close to Tolly. Yeah. I mean, he's three. I mean, this is the amazing no, thing. I, 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 this I, is why I, I'm so interested in, in him, because yeah. he's on such crap land. Yes. And yet he's producing such amazing yields. Exactly. Peter's the same. He's, yeah. on, he's on stony land, and remarkably, people would dismiss it for horticulture, yeah. and yet he's producing the, the most delicious vegetables mm. I've ever tasted. Mm. But what I would say is that if we're going to feed the nation, and by the way, there's one study I'd like to know if you read, which is called the IDRI study. It's a French study which looked at agroecological systems applied nationally in France mm. and Europe, actually, looking at whether Europe could be self-sufficient using an agroecological approach, which is land sharing. And the answer was yes, they could. So I, I recommend like you have a look at that yeah, study. Could, could you send me the Yes, reference? I could. Thank Absolutely. You. We'll, we'll get you the uh, reference. Great. But it's, and it's now, uh, the Soil Association now looking at replicating it in the UK, actually, which is quite interesting to see. And that's what I wanted to say more or less at the end. I think we need to look at what the application of sustainable farming systems across the UK would look like in terms of yields and outputs, and then adjust our diets accordingly, including, of course, those who have ethical objections to eating meat, because they are for part of our human ecology. But I would say that on the more 
extensive farms, of which my farm is one. I would like to be able to grow vegetables in the rotation, but for the rest of the time, the fertility building time, I see no reason why I shouldn't have clover and grass, nor do I see a reason why I shouldn't turn that clover and grass into a livestock product, in my case, cheese, exceedingly delicious cheese, I'm which sure I love you to taste. I'm sure it's the best cheese ever. But, but I'm a vegan, so I don't know. Okay, so you can't do that. Vegan. However, the, the nutritious density of food is something which Sarah Sands, who's just chairing our session, took a great interest in, because there's a a spectrometer mm. on show in the... Uh, I saw it, the BRICS testing. Um, yes, stuff. Yeah, well, the BRICS really is what, yeah. what we've been doing until now. But what it shows is that it will reveal the nutrition density of vegetables right, yeah. and other foods. No, no, the, guy, the guy did a demo for me up upstairs. It was really and interesting. The, and, uh, oh, no, this level. Sarah's yeah. having the, him on the Today programme tomorrow oh, right. morning. Okay. And my daughter Alice, who's a grower mm. uh, in Dagenham. Right. And um, what I believe it will show, this is not science, this is speculation, is that the method of production, in other words, whether it's chemical or sustainable in my terms, will have a dramatic influence on the nutritious density of the food produced. And that's what Peter Seger was just saying in his um, presentation. And if it is true, which was said from the panel, that during my farming lifetime, the nutritional density of food has declined dramatically, and this spectrometer will reveal that, mm. then that brings into question your land sparing argument, because as far as I can see, if you want a land spare, you're more or less reduced to the need to use chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Well, I mean, yeah, you, you know Tolly's work as well as I do, probably better. He's not using any of that. He's, I, mean, I haven't seen the spectrometer testing of his veg, but I bet it's fantastic. Yeah, but he's a lancher. It's amazing. Yeah, but on a, on a, you know, we're talking on a tiny. If you're talking purely horticulture, yeah, but why we, don't you we, include horticulture plus cows in my case? Because as soon as you start bringing the cows in, you start massively increasing the land area. Yes, but as I've tried to point out. In order to produce a, an arable crop, which is a very ecologically expensive thing to do, whether it's vegetables or grain, you need quite a long period of building up soil fertility. And the reason why in the arable lease they haven't needed to have that crop rotation is because they've had nitrogen fertiliser. And yeah. nitrogen fertiliser, as you well know, is probably the most okay. single input that we most um, need to get rid of. No, I, com I completely agree with that. But um, yeah, in the arable east, if they were to in include rotation in that, how much more land would they need? Because you'll well, be taking, you, you would be greatly reducing your grain yield per hectare, wouldn't you? If we converted, let's call it that, mm. the whole of the arable east to sustainable, maybe not exactly... Well, to your rotation system. system. Rotation system. talking about mixed rotation. Yeah. Grain, 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 mixed rotation grain consumption yeah. would halve. Right. Okay. But it's interesting to note... So where would it be dis displaced to? We'd get rid of all intensive livestock production. All chickens, all pigs and all intensive dairy cows. Ah, okay. Gone. Right. So, so now, now, we're, now we're moving on right. to common ground. Okay, so uh, how, how much are you going to cut meat production then? Well, all that meat would go, I'm guessing it would be about 50%, but conversely, I'm speaking to a lot of arable farmers in the east really? of England. At the you're, moment. you're saying that intensive livestock production produces just 50% of our meat? Probably more. A lot more. Well, a yes, but if more. you go back to the 50s when I was growing up, we still ate quite a lot of meat, but it was pigs fed on, you know, mm -hmm waste products, swill in those days, which um, there's a session here looking at how swill can be, you know, safe. But, and I mean, poultry you, you were talking outside. About, I mean, you, look, you know, I'm all in favour of a massive cut in our meat consumption. It much, it's going to be much bigger than 50% if you get rid of all intensity. Yeah, but we need to differentiate right. between the meat, but which then, is part of the problem, which I bet we 100% agree on, and the meat, which we wouldn't agree on, maybe, which is part of the solution for those who don't have ethical objections. And what I'm saying is that in the 50s and before that, the sheep and the beef, not necessarily Cameron Mountain style, but there was a lot of mixed farming. I, mean, I spent a year and a half on a mixed farm, and it was all integrated, and there was a crop rotation because nitrogen fertiliser was well, it's around, but it wasn't wide, so widely used then. And at that point, the red meat was the staple meat, and the chicken was the, uh, the occasional treat. Mm -hmm. You know, once a month when I was growing up. And I think we go back or forward to a diet which is more like that, a lot more plant-based. But the meat that we do eat or would eat, in my opinion, is a pretty central part of the equation because otherwise you can't get the arable farmers of the east to introduce a rotational okay. system. Okay, so, so there's, there's several assumptions here, but let's just examine one of them, which is that arable farming <coughs> of any variety is part of our future. 
Now, well, vegetable production is part of that. Oh, vegetable well. production, definitely. Well, no, well, no vegetable. Uh, let's separate horticulture from arable. I think that's that's quite important for this discussion, actually, because I think field potatoes and carrots, like I used uh, to grow. Pota- potatoes. Now, do you count those as arable or do you count those as horticultural? There, I'm, I'm not sure about potatoes. The rest of it. Well, it, carrots. Uh, carrots are horticultural. I would, I would see in the in the old days a horticultural crop like cabbages or carrots or potatoes used to be part of an arable rotation no, no, I, I, I on a that, mixed farm. You would still call it a horticultural crop. Anyway, yes, let's not yes, split, let's not split yes, heads. Yes, but I guess I, 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 yeah, yeah, okay. But, you know, what but it's I want still to do part of the system. Say, yeah, yeah, no, I, I yeah. But what I want to do is to say, right, let's think about horticulture, and, 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 and which I think has probably got a different future trajectory to arable because... Arable is going to be replaced, I'm sure of it, because of the new technologies which are being developed, where starch is going to be very cheap to produce, oils are going to be very cheap to produce, uh, proteins in particular. You know, if we're looking at microbial protein uh, getting cost parity with soil within a few years, you know, Argentinian soil, the cheapest form of plant protein. No, you, you said why, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. What, why, why would the, we then want to continue doing arable farming? I think the question is whether this lab-based meat or, you know, fermentation process you described from the Finnish people uh, survives its development intact and then becomes viable. And also to refer to things that Joanna Blythman is concerned about, whether the nutritional bioavailability of such products is good enough to nourish us. I mean, I don't know the answers to those questions. Maybe no one does yet, but I, I, I appreciate your exuberant optimism about that technology. Well, I mean, it is an optimism, but there's also, it's informed by pessimism about our prospects of what, you know, where we stand without it. You know, week after week now, I'm reading papers talking about multiple breadbasket failures. You know, this is, this is now a commonplace phrase in the scientific literature, and, and you know, we're talking about... You know, some of them are talking about multiple bread basket failures at 1.5 degrees of heating, let alone two, three, yeah. four. Yeah, I, I, I mean, the reason I, I think, got I think we're, we're heading for the darkest period of human history yeah, because um, of migration and food short food it's insecurity. Really, it's, I, I mean, I, I, I got into all this because I was literally being kept awake at night by thinking, how the hell is everyone going to yeah. be fed? How is it, it just didn't seem possible. You know, when you look at all the different factors, climate breakdown, Water loss, you know, the loss of aquifers, retreated glaciers, uh, loss of dry season rainfall, um, soil loss, yeah. uh, pollinator loss. Yeah. You put all that together and you think it just doesn't it add is up. And, and then I would finally get to sleep and I would have these nightmares. I had this recurrent nightmare of these people trying to leave this grey waste and there were border guards beating them back. And then you'd wake up and think, oh, well, it's just a nightmare. And then Oh, wait a minute. No, you know, it's not. It really isn't. This is reality. No, it's, so, uh, it's, it is apocalyptic. Yeah, yeah. And it's scary. But yeah. I would say that I wasn't just being, you know, kind to the people in this gathering. Most of the people here, I've known of them for more than 40 years, they have been focusing on these sort of issues. And I think there's collective wisdom and knowledge there and expertise which could be part of the transition. Well, look, all, all that is great. And, you know, I've got massive respect for the people here. And, you know, many of them are old friends. Yeah. Um, and, um, and, and, and that's, all pre- you know, it, it, we don't have that power against climate breakdown. You know, this is this monstrous thing. It's the biggest ch- challenge humanity has ever faced, the biggest crisis we've yeah. ever faced. And, and there's a guy... And the, and, 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 wait, wait a minute, Patrick. And the crisis, you know, really hits on... Food supply. That you know, that yeah. that's where it hits us hardest. And so, you know, I got very interested in these new food technologies because I don't see any other way out. Well, I think if you prove to be right, and that these new technologies can go to scale, and produce vast quantities of stuff which you've already eaten in the form of a pancake, and maybe others will, will as well. I'm not sure if I want to. Um, fair enough, you know, or as we say in Wales, quite a take. One head, but, one head. <laughs> but, you know, I'm, I'm, the jury's out on it still, and you may be right. But in the meantime, those of us that still believe in ecological system management to produce food production coexisting with nature, our biggest challenge is to develop farming systems which are not just carbon zero net emissions, but actually carbon negative. In other words, if you look at the, so- the system as a totality, it'll be taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. 
That is the scale of the challenge we need to set ourselves because it's, it would be the equivalent of rewilding. Yeah. Well, that and would be if my interest yeah. is okay. rewilding not on its own, but the sort of thing that Tolly is doing, building soil carbon, but at the same time harvesting a surplus mm -hmm. of food without diminishing the natural capital. Now, I think that is a, a legitimate, um, what's the word, Co fellow traveller mm -hmm. with your vision of switching to fermented, okay. you know, hydrogen fueled food. So absolutely what Tolly is doing is totally compatible with that vision, which is why I included him in, in the programme. And so is what Peter is doing, by the yeah, way. Yeah, no, sure. I, I just haven't been to Peter's farm yet. But, but um, you know, I don't, I, whether that's applicable to arable, uh, to grain production and the rest of it, I would very much doubt because, you know, you're talking about a very intensive process, what Tolly's doing, you know, in a very know, small area of land. You, but you've heard this term regenerative farming, which is, yes, which which is, is gaining is, traction. Or what used to be there. called farming is now called regenerative well, farming. Well, I, I think, think that's sustainable development. It's just this label being attached to everything. Come on, I mean, you've seen it attached to almost every form of production now, haven't you? I'm going on a bit of a travel pilgrimage next year to some of the most, uh, the best examples of um, farming systems which are claiming to be carbon neutral, carbon negative. And most of them involve livestock, which is interesting. And obviously we need the science to show whether this is true or not, and we haven't yet got it. But if it were to prove to be the case, and don't forget that all the soils of the Midwest were built with an interaction of bison and grass, you know, because that's how, in many cases, well, soils Well, actually, were built. the bison population was probably a post-crash phenomenon mm. after the Native American genocide. Yes, I, I, I know increased. about some of that. But uh, however, can, can I just roll you back on that? Because actually, there is already a huge amount of science on whether livestock production sequesters carbon or not. I and it shows that, that in the vast majority of cases, possibly in all of them, it doesn't. Well, so, uh, I, 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 you know, I can trade you on the science on that. That is an area actually, I'm comfortable in. Well, you know, uh, because the food, food and Climate Research Network had 300 sources in their Grayson News report. They found that the maximum sequestration was between 20 and 60 percent of the carbon costs of livestock. Moreover, if you compare it to, say, your arable monoculture, you might be able to sequester some yes. carbon. If you're comparing it to a rewilded ecosystem you would struggle anywhere to find any improvement on well, that. Well, here's, here's, here's my version of the same science. Which probably, you'd probably be able to agree with most of it anyway. If you take a de degraded arable soil, which has got an organic matter level down to 1 or 2%, and you put it into grassland, you will get a continuous increase in soil organic matter up to a plateau period of about 20 years, after which there's not that much more carbon sequestration. That's the Pete Smith line, and he was in the FRCN study. There is a growing body of opinion, and I subscribe to this body, which you won't be surprised to hear, uh, that the application of holistic grazing systems uh, can further increase the soil organic matter levels, not the same in each soil, okay. depending whether it's well, sand you'll need some, you'll need some science that. behind that, yes, because at do. the moment the claims are unscientific. I mean, Alan Sager... Peter really Sager, by the way, is amongst that number. Yeah. Uh, yeah, He's got incredible yeah, high organic matter levels in his soil. And it does not equal data. And, and you know, we've got, you know, Alan Savory, bless him, you know, seven million people have watched his TED talk. It's complete bollocks. You know, it's just, it just doesn't it's, stand up at all. It's not complete bollocks. <laughs> oh, well, sorry, here's, bullshit. More here's what I'd say <laughs> about Alan Savory, a man who, with, for whom I have a lot of respect. He has not yet been able to demonstrate what he claims is backed by science. That doesn't mean to say that many farmers, including myself, who have applied holistic grazing systems, have not observed a significant increase in productivity. In science, and one I tends to do it the other way around. You make the observation, then you make the claim. Uh, he's made the claim, yes, and then he's saying, we'll find the observations. Yes, and, but and as, that, you, as you will also agree, most scientific in, um, developments were preceded by intuition that something might be right, uh, which was the hypothesis, probably led to the hypothesis, which then tested. So we're naughty we're farmers like me... in the realm of intuition, and naughty, that intuition hasn't checked out when well, it's been tested by scientific studies. Well, uh, in case of the studies on grassland, 
there has not yet been a, a, a decent study looking at ho the application of holistic grazing systems on soil carbon outcomes. It just hasn't taken place. So in the absence of such studies... No, that's not true. Uh, I think so every time there is such a study, Alan and others say, oh, it hasn't really looked at a proper holistic system. So well, you say, what's a proper holistic system? And then you say, but wait a minute, that's a different definition to the one you gave me last year. You know, so it's this one of well, these I, slippery you know, the thing terms is, like regenerative agriculture, which you just slap on things and say, oh, look, that's, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's holistic, that's regenerative. Right. But, you know, it, it's ill-defined. Uh, as soon as you get a result you don't like, you say that wasn't a real holistic system, that wasn't a real regenerative system, so uh, they haven't proved us wrong. Well, That's I, not I, how science works, Patrick. I, I'd like to think that I'm not amongst that number who are anti-science and just want to reinvent my case every time uh, the one I don't like is disproved. Uh, I would say that it's very legitimate for farmers who are natural innovators to try something, see if it works, and if it does work, do it again. And I'm amongst that number. I've been farming for 46 years on my farm. And during most of that time, I've been practicing what's called set stocking, which is a sort of diminished version of Cambrian Mountain sheep stocking. It's not as bad as that, but it's not ideal. I've recently drunk the Kool-Aid, not just of Alan Savory, but of others like Joel Salatin. And I've applied those principles in holistic grazing systems, by which I mean 12 hours of grazing and moving on. I've noticed significant increases in productivity and changes in sward composition, and I think it's fairly likely that if you get that increase in productivity, you've got a below ground carbon sequestration that goes up yet. We haven't been monitoring the outcomes, so I haven't got science to validate that, but it is my observation that the system works. Okay. Well, yeah, um, let's see the results when, when you get some scientists on. And uh, you've been very generous with your time. You were generous in accepting the invitation to speak and having, you know, a lot of people challenge your various... Um, uh, predictions and uh, you were generous in and uh, having this talk with me afterwards. Thank you, George. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Cheers.